John chapter 12, if you would stand, it would be a very, very, very simple word. That would be the gospel of John. Starting at verse 1. It reads, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, when he raised from the dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. They came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we bless you one more time. And I'm asking that you would take this word, Lord, and plant it in hearts and do something new and something fresh. This simple text here, God, I believe, has great power behind it and for the reason of that you have spoken, and I know it. And I'm asking that you would take this word and what you intend to do with it and bring forth in the lives of the people exactly what you intend to bring forth in the lives of the people tonight. We bless you. We want to glorify you in all that we say and do. And we just ask, God, that you have your way in every respect and everybody here. We bless you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all be seated. So in the Bible, the story of the Apostle Paul's conversion is found several times in the New Testament. In fact, it's found three times in the book of Acts alone. We see it in the ninth chapter when Luke testifies of it from a historical perspective. And then we see it again in Acts 22 when Paul defends himself before a Jewish audience. And then it's told again in Acts 26 when he defends himself before a Roman council. Now beyond the book of Acts, you can, you can find references of Paul's conversion in his own letters at least two more times, once in Philippians 3 and again in 1 Timothy chapter 1. So just like Paul, our text says that many of the Jews came to the house that Lazarus was in, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Hear me again. I said, because Lazarus had been raised from the dead, or because of his testimony, the Bible says that many of the Jews believed on Jesus. Church, the word tonight is not theologically deep in any manner, any way, shape, or form. What I'm fixing to say to you, you need to consider as much as you can consider. Tonight, I'm here to tell you as simply as I know how. The other day, I was going through John chapter 12, and when I got to this text, and it says they didn't come for Jesus' sake only, but to see Lazarus, who he raised from the dead, the Lord spoke these words to me and these words only. Do not underestimate the power of your testimony. I said, the Lord said to me, do not underestimate the power of your testimony. So in the Greek, the word testimony is the word martyria, which means evidence, but it's not just any evidence. By looking at the words, you'll notice that the root of the word there is martyr. Now, in case you didn't know what a martyr was, that would be somebody that dies for their faith or dies for what they believe in. So in essence, a testimony can be defined as the evidence of what nearly killed you, but didn't. I said, it's the evidence of what uh, you made it through, your toughest trial or your experience or this thing that maybe you went through, whatever it was that tried to kill you, whatever it is that tried to take you out, whatever it is that came against you to bring destruction, or maybe it is what the doctor said that you shouldn't live. This evidence that says what's what so is not so, that's your testimony. 
So to put it as simply as I know, your testimony is the story of what Christ has brought you through to the place that you are right now today. And because of his faithful hand on your life, you're able to tell people that are maybe going through a similar thing or experiencing something that you've gone through before, what it is that God delivered you from so that they might find hope just the same. So again, our text says that the people weren't there necessarily to see Jesus only, that they were there to see a man that had been raised from the dead. I said they weren't just there to see Jesus. They were here. They were there to, to hear the testimony of a man that Jesus had touched. So you know as good as I do, if, if we're in the house and we've ever had a touch from the Lord and he's ever done anything in our life, that we've all had experiences that have cut us to the core. And some of those experiences are probably our fault and some of them maybe aren't our fault. But whatever the case is, I'm here to tell you that with visible or invisible markings, that there's been things in your life that has cut you in some manner. Now, somebody that once struggled with sexual sin, they might live their life in a way that they feel ashamed or condemned often. And maybe there's others that have been abused and they have a hard time finding and feeling loved. There's maybe other folks that still have the scarring on their arms from the dope that they did in the past. But the, the point is that I want you to get a hold of before we go too far into this is these moments might have been the markings of the beginning of your testimony, but they are not the end. Now, when you share your testimony with people, take note. Because it not only connects you with other folks, but it raises you above the influence of your past and it releases hope that there's something greater. I said your testimony, if you would, it'll raise you above the influence of your past, but it has the ability to release hope because of something greater to hope for. Now, each one of us that's ever believed on Jesus, that's really come to a saving faith in Jesus. We're rescued and brought through something so that you might declare his goodness of the one that brought you out of darkness into light. That's the very reason that he brought you out of it. It wasn't just necessarily to save you from hell, but it was to proclaim the one that was, has the ability to deliver you. And the day that we're living in, folks, I'm telling you right now that it's absolutely crucial, as dark as it's getting, that people find hope in this resurrection life that you and I have living in us. And more than ever before, people need a confidence that there actually is a God that can set them free, that there actually is a God that loves them and knows how to transform their life, that he really does exist. And what you have and what you've experienced and what I've experienced, they too can experience just the same. Folks, your testimony has the power to release hope. Think about it. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter had raised the lame man from the, from, at the temple gate and he was made whole, I'm going to read to you the text. Acts 4, 14. And behold, the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do these men? For they indeed a notable, notable, notable miracle hath been done by them as manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name no more. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Why do you suppose that they commanded that they not testify of what God had done? Because there's power in your testimony, folks. I'm telling you, people like to hear from somebody that knows what they're talking about. People want to hear from somebody that's been through the thing they're going through. They want to hear from the horse's mouth what it is that's been experienced. I said, do not underestimate the power of your testimony. He goes on to say in verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men 
glorified God for that which was done. Notice what it says happened because of the testimony of the lame man or the formerly lame man. It says all men glorified God for that which was done. And I'm telling you right now, folks, everybody in this building, even folks that aren't saved for that matter, you know as good as I do that if God's ever moved in your life and he's ever delivered you from something and you were able to tell somebody, look at what God has done in my life. I was facing destruction. I was bound up by this or I was bound up by that. And he was faithful to set me free. I'm telling you, when somebody that's going through the same thing has heard that God has set you free, they begin to think and they begin to have hope in their heart that says, maybe me too. Maybe I can get on board with that. Right. Folks, this is a big deal. Yeah. But here's the real truth anyway. Your testimony is ultimately not even about you. It's about what the Lord has done for you. Right. In fact, the only reason that you have a testimony tonight is because Jesus has brought you through something. Psalm chapter 119, I'm going to read it to you. Verse 46 says, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. It says, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Now regarding in Luke chapter 8, the man that had legion and deep, and Jesus took the devils and cast them into a herd of swine. I want to read to you that text. Luke chapter 8, 38 and 39 says, now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. It says he published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done for him. See, how many of you know that regardless of what you've been through, no matter how great or small you think it is, that Jesus has given you reason enough to stand on a housetop and proclaim his goodness and proclaim his delivering power? That how many of you know that regardless of where you are or what you've been through, that you've got reason enough right now because of his faithful hand in your life to stand on the highest housetop and proclaim to the world, my God is good. Look at what he's done for me. If he's done it for me, he can do it for you. If he's broke my chains, your chains are nothing. I've had all the change you can possibly have. If he set me free, there's nothing. I said nothing that he can't break off of your life. Right. Psalm chapter 71. I want to read you that one. Starting at verse 15. It says, my mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge. Their number is past my knowledge. I think about what God has done sometimes and recall things that I have forgotten. I wish that I had journaled from the day I got saved what God had done because I'm telling you folks, I have books upon books upon books. There's things I remember sometimes that I thought I totally forgot what God had done there until there was reason to recall it. I'm telling you, he's faithful to do something all the time. So it says, my mouth will tell of your righteous acts and your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. Oh God, from my youth, you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even the old age and gray hairs of God do not forsake me, which he will not under the, old, under the new covenant. Until I proclaim your might to another generation and your power to all those to come. Psalm 66. Verse 16, I'll read you another one. It says, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. It says, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I'm telling you folks, there was a time when I was first saved. You could catch me on a street corner. You could catch me on a bench at work. You could catch me just about anywhere proclaiming what God has done for my soul. Because I'm telling you folks, I got a long laundry list of things I've done for the devil, but I got a longer laundry list of what Jesus Christ did through his blood taking my sins though they were scarlet and making them white as snow. I'm telling you folks, I've got reason enough I don't know about you to proclaim what God has done for my soul and I ain't gonna quit doing it all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever but until then folks, I'm telling you I will proclaim his works unto the people. I will proclaim his works unto every creature. They shall hear the goodness of the Lord. Second Timothy Chapter 1, verse 8 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Why not? Why not? 
Because Revelation chapter 12 says that you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, folks. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. There's something that you've been through that's unique to you. There's something that Jesus has carried you through. And there's nobody else in the world that can duplicate your story. I said, there's things that Ed's gone through that none of us has ever gone through that God has pulled him out of. I said, there's things that Brandon's experienced that nobody else in this house ever has or ever will experience. And I'm telling you, he's got a testimony to speak because there's going to be somebody in his workplace or somebody in his family or somebody somewhere that has something similar going on and they need to hear about the hand of God. Amen. Folks, the truth is this, is that most folks won't come to Jesus until they hear the testimony of a man that they can meet and talk to in person. Right. That until they hear from you and what God has done for you, most of them won't ever come to him. I worked with a guy I've told you about before. He said, so you, you're telling me. And he was curious because God had been working on him. It ain't the first time I told him. Not the second or third time I've told him. I told him countless times. But this time he came to me. He says, so you're telling me that when you got saved, God took away all of your addictions. You didn't have a 12-step program. You didn't have to go through a rehab. You mean to tell me you don't smoke crack or meth ever anymore? You mean to tell me all of that went away at one time? I said, it absolutely did. And if he absolutely took it from me, he can absolutely take it from you. He said, I wish the Lord would do that for me. I said, I'm telling you, he can do it for you just the same as he did for me. I had a whole lot more chains than most people ever have. And I'm telling you, he broke them off me like they weren't even there. And I'm telling you right now, folks, regardless of where you are, regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you're going through, God has the ability with a word spoken or even a thought thought to take away everything that's come against you in your life in a moment's time. And I'm telling you, folks, that most of the world is groaning and waiting for you to manifest and the simplest thing you can do as you do is to testify of what God has done for you. And I'm telling you right now, you have an indictment and a responsibility on your head that says you got to do it. Because Jesus has so loved you enough that he has bought you from the pit of hell and said, I set you free. So now we have a responsibility to tell that world who is running full steam ahead to that place called hell right now that the Lord can set you free. And I know it to be so because he did me. Do not. Underestimate the power of your testimony. That's all they said to me when I read this. That's it. And it could be because, you know what? I just don't feel like I've shared it as much lately as I once did. But I knew he wanted to stir you just the same. Think about it. How many people do you see during the day that you could have shared something with them? How do you know? How do you know? The girl at the gas station that works the register is it going through the exact same thing that you just got free from? What if you said, I know Jesus loves you. I want to talk to you about him. She began to tell you her story and what she was going through. And you were like, yeah, I can totally relate to that because God set me free from it. And I'm telling you right now that he's ready to set you free from it. Folks, people are waiting for hope and they're going to find it through Christ who is nestled tightly within your testimony. John chapter 4, verse 29. The woman at the well. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Let me read it again. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So the woman testified and then what did the people do? It says they came unto Jesus. I said the woman went out. She told her testimony. All she did was say, I had an encounter with this one who was able to tell me all I've ever done. And because of that, people were like, really? So they began to go to Jesus. Folks, your story might encourage an addict that freedom really can be found. Your story might convince the sick man that what the doctor said is not the final answer. And your story, your testimony might be the avenue in which people who are depressed and feel like they have no hope find hope because they can see the evidence of it in what you're saying about what God has done for you. Folks, it really doesn't matter how big or small you think your testimony is. It has the power to change people's lives. So do not underestimate the power of your 
testimony. So I'm telling you, do not underestimate the power of your testimony. I'm going to tell you, this is probably pride. How many times I've sat and I've heard from people that would try and tell me what they thought they knew. And I thought, I don't want to hear a word you say until you've experienced it. I don't really want to hear from you if you don't really know what you're talking about. Because everything you're saying to me is just based upon what you've heard. I want to hear from somebody that's been through it. I want to hear from somebody that's been down that road. I want to hear from somebody that's experienced what you're experiencing. You say, well, I was never addicted. I never went to prison. I never experienced the stuff you did. Yeah, but you went through depression and God set you free. Or you went through financial loss and God restored you. Your house burnt to the ground and God gave you a new one and you couldn't afford it. You have a testimony, folks. I'm telling you, everybody in this house regardless of what it looks like, has a testimony. Well, I had cancer once and God set me free. Let me tell you how big a testimony that is. I said, well, I didn't feel too well one time, and in a moment's time, God took it away. I didn't even ask. Let me tell you how big that testimony is. It doesn't matter how big or small you think your testimony is, folks. It has the power to change somebody's life. I'm serious, man. I'm serious. John chapter 9. I want to read your text. I'm not going to say a whole lot more, I don't think. They used to call Wednesday night's prayer meeting, and we need to make that a reality. John chapter 9. Starting in verse 24, it says, For the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know is that, thou, that though I was blind, now I see. Let me read it again. They said, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. And I'm telling you folks, one thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. Is one thing I do know is that if I look back or if I were to dig through my closets, I would find two inches of motion discovery, which says I got over 90 some felonies, which would say I've got misdemeanor upon misdemeanor upon misdemeanor, which I could write out a whole book on how many doors I put my foot through and how many guns I put to people's heads. And how many crack stems I've broken trying to get high on crack and how many the lives of meth I've snorted while my kids were being born in the hospital. I said, I can tell you how many times I've, I've ate 60 or 70 pills and washed it down with a half a gallon of whiskey in 30 seconds and should be dead. I can tell you folks how many times I did heroin upon heroin upon heroin. I said, I can tell you how many times I broke into the store and took the cash register and everything in it and walked away and then I went back to Two weeks later to the same store and did it again. I said, I can tell you how many times I went into people's houses and put a gun to the man's head while he was asleep, challenged him to move while I emptied out the place. But I'm going to tell you this too, that there was a night that I was saying, God, you're weak. And he said, okay. And he came into my living room and he had, I had an encounter with him that night. And he said, I've come to set you free. I ain't mad at you. I'm not here to hold the past against you. I'm here to put to death who you used to be. And you're going to rise up from that and I'm telling you folks, in a moment's time, my sin was taken away. I never did heroin again. I never did meth again. I never smoked crack again. In fact, I never wanted it again. I never cussed my granny again. I never broke into a store again. I never put a gun to anybody's head again. I never did any of that again. Why? Because who the sun says free is free indeed. And I'm telling you folks right now, I am free indeed. There is therefore now zero. I said zero. God did for me. I am accepted by the Father. He loves me. He has received me. I am not forsaken. I am bought with the price. I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm an heir of the throne. I'm seated in heavenly places. As he is, so am I right now. God looks upon me exactly like he looks upon Jesus. There is nothing. I said there is absolutely nothing that he's mad at me about. And because of it, I can tell you right now that if you're going through it, he can set you I remember putting rags in people's gas tanks and setting them on fire just to do it. 
I remember taking blow torches and going in places, melting the doors off the hinges just to take their safe. Unbelievable. I remember beating up dope dealers and taking their dope in my own living room. And I could do this all day of all the things I've done. But the testimony isn't what I've done. The testimony is what he did about what I've done. Yes. The testimony is not a testimony until I can say this is what God did about it. Yes. And I'm telling you, what he did not do was condemn me. Because I've never in my life encountered such mercy in my life. I've told most of you, but I told the Lord that night, I said, God, you're weak. You're weak. Kill me if you can. Folks, I'm telling you, he came to me. He came to me in glory and holiness and beauty. And he never said a word about my sin. He never said a word. And I'm telling you folks, that encounter with such grace after I shook a fist at him, called him weak, said GD every day, all the time, sin upon sin upon sin, perversion upon perversion, crime upon crime. He came and said, I love you. I've known you since the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I predestined you for my purpose. You couldn't help but get saved. You didn't really have much say so in the matter. I hate to get very Presbyterian on you right now, but I'm telling you, I didn't ask him to come to me. I didn't come knocking on his door. I called him weak and he invited himself in and he showed me who was really weak. And he did exactly what I asked. He put me to death, but not in the manner that I was expecting. And from that day forward, folks, I lived to tell people that this is the Jesus I know. This is what he does. This is what he's capable of. When I got saved with that many felonies, nobody wanted to hire me. Nobody wanted to give me a job. But I found a man that gave me a job at a pizza place. And that pizza place become a factory. That factory become a better factory. And then a better factory. $10 turned into 13, and then 14, and then 17, and then 20. And I'm going to quit there. And I'm telling you, it got stupid. And I thought, God, what is going on? I didn't have a license. The amount of traffic violations I had says I should not only be a habitual offender, but I should never drive again. And I had somebody say, I'm paying for your license. You don't have to pay for it. We're going to get it back for you. There was no way with my credit or anything of the sort that I could ever get a vehicle, but God worked it out. There was no way with my credit and all the sort that I could get another vehicle, but God worked it out. So there was no way with my credit that I could ever get a home, but I'm telling you, God's going to work it out. God's going to work it out. I was sitting here beside the church earlier. I looked over at the church. I looked at the stones because they speak to me, the faithful hand of God, that he will do what he said he will do. That if he started it, he will finish it. And I was looking back on my life. I said, God, right now I see a whole lot of hurdles. In fact, I see a lot more obstacles today than I saw three days ago when I asked y'all to pray for me. But I'm telling you right now, I looked at these stones and I felt the Lord and I thought God started something. He's going to finish. He's been faithful every time and he's going to keep being faithful, folks. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to live my life from beginning to end. It don't matter if I die in a year or in 30 years or whatever the case might be. I'm going to make it a point that everybody I see gets to hear a little bit about Jesus and what he's done for me. I said, there's people that I work with that are bound by addiction or go home every night because they feel like unless they have six to eight beers that they can't get through the night or go to sleep. But I'm telling you right now that the God I know has the ability to give sleep to his beloved that I don't have to have any kind of substance to put me down. I said, I don't have to cling to anything else because he's the one that I claim to, that I can profess unto them and proclaim his name loudly, that he is the Savior, he is the Lord. You can come on any name you want to, but only one will answer by fire. I'll tell it to every Muslim I meet. You call on Allah, but he can't talk to you. He doesn't exist. You call on Buddha, you can rub his belly at lows. He's on sale, but he can't speak to you. But the Jesus I know, I said, he will come. He will answer by fire. He will set you free. How do I know? Because he set me free. I have a testimony of a good, good father that's never let me down. I said, I got a testimony of a good, good God who's never broke his promise. He's never walked 
the way. He's never left me or forsake me. He's never forgotten about me. He's never quit on me. He's not going to start now. He hasn't done it before. I'm telling you, God is good. And we as the people of God have a responsibility right now to go about into all of the world and tell the people we know what we've been delivered from and this God that we serve and what he's capable of doing. I said, Nancy's got a testimony that's greater than she knows. If it would be that we would be found faithful to tell it, I'm telling you folks, people are getting free in a way we never thought they'd get free. We're looking for a great move of God to come to pass from a distant place. What if you would be faithful with what he's already done? What if all it takes is that the people of God says, look at what Jesus did for me and know that he can do it for you. What happened in all the texts that I just read to you that they went about and says, I don't know if he's a sinner. In fact, I don't know much about it. What I do know is I was blind, but now I see. What I do know is he told me all that I've done. And I'm telling you, folks, he's the one. He's the one that sets you free. He's the one that knows your name. He's the one that broke your chains. And right now, we as the people of God got to tell the world before they go to hell what it is they can find in Christ Jesus the Lord. We got to tell them right now before it's too late who our Savior is. Let's meet with him. Let's just do that. Do not underestimate The number of people that's had a raised eyebrow when they've heard what I've been delivered from. You can't count them. Somebody told me recently of their son that says there's no way. No way. No way. And I'm telling you, that's the impact of the testimony. That seed will find good soil at some point. But he has heard and he knows that there is a Jesus that can. And now he's thinking about it. Is it really possible? I'm telling you, folks, it's absolutely possible. It's absolutely possible. There ain't a day that goes by where I think about going to Johnson Court and getting a 50 rock of crack and smoking it. Not one day. Not one day. It's never crossed my mind that the truck driver I had that was on meth that I could say, hey, you think I could get a little bit of that? Never, not one time since I met this Jesus. I lived my life for me. To get high. To be a freeloader. To hurt people, do whatever benefited me. And in an instant, in a moment, I'm telling you, Jesus took it all away. 90 plus felonies. And I got on being verified or whatever it is, and it says there's no record to be found on this name. I thought, are you serious? Who in the world else could wipe away all of those felonies to where they're not seen on the computer? There is no record to be found on this name. They gave me a list of family members so they knew who they were talking about, but there was no record to be found on that name. This is where you lived. This is some of the people you've been associated with, but we don't really have a record on you. You better know, neither does heaven. people on the other side of the camera and for anybody that's here that may need to hear it. If you've got anything in your life, anything at all that's plagued you at all, that you don't want in your life or you know doesn't belong there, I'm telling you that I know one. I know the one whose name is above every name, who has the power to save that he still delivers, he still sets free, he still heals. And I've seen testimony upon testimony upon testimony of spiritual healing, soulless healing, and physical healing. She can't tell me he doesn't do one or the three of those today because I've seen him do it all on a regular basis. And right now, I'm telling you, if you need a touch from the Lord in any matter, you need to come and let us pray for you. Right now, you need to drop all pride and say, I don't care what people think, and come and meet the Lord who's nestled in again right here at the altar. I'm telling you, we'll meet you here and we'll help you. If there's anybody on the other side of these cameras, I know there's over 500 people that watch these cameras at least that doesn't know how to get free from your sin or doesn't know what to do with your addiction or your bondage or the things that you do in the secret place at nighttime when you think nobody else is watching or when the internet has you in a place that you don't want to be. I'm telling you, I know one that knows how to break your chain right now and his name is Jesus. And he said, if anybody calls upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. And if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That it's with the heart you believe and are justified. It's with the mouth you confess, I say, testify and are saved, folks. Somebody's got to know Jesus is the answer. Father, we bless you. 
I don't want to underestimate the power of my testimony. When I meet people, sometimes I, sometimes I want to get theologically deep from A to Z and tell them things they never thought of. And you know what? I don't want to underestimate the power of my testimony. I don't want to glory in anything but the cross of Christ. It's the power of God. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would take the word that was spoken tonight and cause it to compel us, God, to, to not hold back and testify of what you've done. We might not know what else to say, but we can do like those in the scriptures which said they told of what they had been delivered from. We don't know much else, but we do know the one that did it, and we know what happened to us when he did. And I'm asking God that you would touch hearts here tonight, that everywhere we went, we would testify. No matter how small or great we think it is, we would testify. And who knows where that seed might land, but God, I'm praying that you cause the people to go forth faithful and do what you've called us to do. God, we thank you that we do have testimonies. We thank you that you're the living God who ever lives and ever intercedes to make intercession for us. You live for us, God. You stand in the gap. You're alive and well today. Oh, God. Some of us have testimonies and some of us need a testimony in something right now. And God, I'm asking that you help us to remember what you've been faithful in thus far. So that we can take hold of what it is we're needing you to do now. Because you're faithful in all things. When we fail to abide faithful, you're always faithful. And we bless you for it. God, we don't come to get something from you, but this is what we do know. Is that it's your good pleasure to set men free and to break chains. That's who you are. In fact, I don't know if you can't help but to do it because it's just in your nature and it's in your power. That when you come nigh unto anything wicked, it breaks. And I'm just asking, Lord, that you be in the midst in such a thick way that, that sin and things begin to melt off of people's lives. And I'm asking that you set a fresh fire in the hearts of the people of God, that we would go about and testify the good things of the living God and what you've done. That we'd speak the name of Jesus, that chains could be broken and people could get free. God, that we would go about and tell of your faithful hand time and time again on us so that other folks in a similar boat could get free too. Jesus' name.